Well, if you're glad to be in church, say amen this morning. Y'all give the Lord a hand again this morning. Thank Him for being here. Boy, it's good to see you. Glad you're in God's house. And I'm so excited about preaching a sermon on the family. I, 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 just, I get excited when it's time to preach about the family. It just, it just does something for me. And Facebook, we're so glad you've joined us. Some of our folks are at home, and we're so glad that you've joined us today. We want you to just comment, get in the service, share the service. We're so glad you chose to worship with us today. And if you're here and this is the very first time you've ever been to Liberty, I just want to say thank you for being here. We know you could have went anywhere to worship the Lord today, but we're so glad you chose to worship right here with us. We hope you feel at home. We just want you to feel welcome. Just sit back for a little bit and let's just worship the Lord and hear from his word today. And when I preach about the family, I just feel like I need to give kind of a disclaimer on it. I, I want you to know, church, that I'm, I, I'm passionate about the family. There's, there's nothing more important to me than my family. No, nothing. Nothing more important. Sometimes when you call me and text me and I don't call you right back, text you right back, it's because I'm with my family. I, I mean, I'm just passionate about family. I believe it's the most, uh, the greatest need for our community, the greatest need for our country, it's the greatest need for our state, is for God's people to come together and have whole, warm, wonderful, godly families that raise kids. I want to give you this disclaimer because I want you to get this, church. If we don't get the family right, we miss everything. You, how many of you realize you can't bring your, ki your bad kids to church and in 30 minutes we turn them into good kids? Everybody realize that? You, you can't take your bad kids to school. Expect that teacher to make your kids good. If you ain't doing it at home, guess what? It ain't happening in here. You can't have a terrible, broken down marriage, show up for church for 20 minutes, and expect your marriage to get better. It starts at home. And I want to just warn you this morning, as I preach this sermon series over the next few weeks, this is going to be one of the most real sermon series I've ever preached. I'm going to say things that you might find a little bit odd, you might be challenged by it. You might be like, oh, Lord, preacher's after me. I want you to know that I have not spied on anybody. I don't know what you do at your home. I have no idea. And if you posted something on Facebook and you think I'm mentioning it, I promise you, i got a lot of other things to do than to stalk your Facebook page. I promise. And so I don't want you to take it, but, but, but I want it to be real. I want it to be just something that is real because there's a pressure to preaching on the family. There's a pressure. You know, people, you get up here and you preach on the family, you know what they think? Well, pastor must be a perfect husband. You know the problem I got with preaching like that, right? My wife's in the service when I'm preaching. I, I can't talk about my perfect marriage because guess what? My wife's sitting in the audience. I sure can't talk about our perfect children because she's sitting in the audience. And I want to be so real, I'll do something I've never done in 12 years of pastoring, 13 years of preaching. I'm going to invite my wife to the stage. Would y'all make her feel welcome? Everybody give her a hand. She, love, she loves being up in front of everybody, don't you, babe? <laughs> she loves it. I got her a stool so she could sit down because if you've ever been up here, the temperature goes up like 10 degrees the minute you step up here and you get really nervous. But I wanted to talk to you about marriage, and I was talking about that, and we were talk, me and Liam were talking about this service. I said, you know, there's pressure when I'm preaching about how your family should be because I don't want people to get this idea that I'm somehow saying that I got a perfect family and I got it all figured out. And that, that, so that's kind of the opposite of what I'm trying to do. So, babe, there's people in here that have been with us since the first day, since the day we first started pastoring. And not, not many of you because, you know, you can't stay around me that long. But there's, there's a few of you that have been here that long. Some of you have been here for years and know us for years. And then some of you, this is like your first or second or third Sunday, and, and you don't know anything about us. And so, babe, tell them a little bit about our family. Tell us how we got started. Tell them who and what we are. Well, I'm Lynn. I'm his wife. We've been married for 27 years. 27 years. Can you believe that? That's a long time. <laughs> I, I've got a picture to prove that. Y'all ready? Check this picture out. Huh? Look at that. This is our wedding picture on the right, and this is our dating picture on the left. He robbed the cradle. Does she look like she's like 12 or what? I mean, does she look young there or what? It's crazy. I was 17 here. I was a baby. He was almost 19, not even quite 19 yet. So yep. we were both babies. Yeah, we got married super young. Yeah. Would you recommend it to anybody Definitely else? Definitely not. Definitely not. Don't do that. It worked out great for us. 
but only because the Lord helped us and watched over us and it guided us. It worked out great for the last 15 years. <laughs> yeah. But we would not recommend getting married at 17. So don't come to us and say, well, you did. So, yeah, don't do that. So, babe, how, so from there, 17, or 27 years, those two kids. With those two kids had four kids, and two of those got married. So I have a daughter-in-law and a son-in-law, and they gave us two of the best-looking grand dudes in the world. Got two grand dudes. Look at this, check this out. Right. Check this out right here. Yeah. A the, lot can happen in 27 years. Yeah, <laughs> we went from a, a couple to a tribe, didn't we? And I just, but the grandkids are worth all of it. Every bit of it. It's 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 the reason you know we didn't kill the kids. Yes, thank God. <laughs> so, babe, I've been we've been married 27 years. We got four kids, two in laws, which we love like kids, and two grand dudes. Does out of all that, do you think I'm qualified on preaching about? The perfect husband, perfect marriage, perfect home. No. No, that's exactly right. No. <laughs> we've made plenty of mistakes. A lot, yeah, we made a lot of mistakes. A lot of mistakes. And, and, and when we made those mistakes, what would you say is the most contributing factor to why we messed up? Without a doubt, it's when we've let God slip from his place as priority in our family, when we focused on us and took him off of the... Took him out of charge, got him out of, out of place. And, and we've made a bunch of mistakes over the years, but just keep coming back to the Lord, keep going back to the Lord, and he's blessed us through it already. And I'm so grateful. <laughs> I am too. Y'all give her a hand. Thank you so much, babe. <laughs> you know, what I, what I want to say is today we've made tons of mistakes, tons of mistakes. So when I preach this message in this sermon series, I want you to know I'm not preaching from a place of I've arrived, we got it all figured out, our family's great. You know what I'm preaching from? Mistakes we've made, times we've messed up, times we've failed. We're, we're, we're preaching about things we learned that we would not do again. And we're going to be preaching, more importantly, on what the Word of God says about family. You see, as a person, we've got tons of mistakes, tons of mistakes. Things I would change in my heart and life, but you can't. But you can learn from them, and you can pass those things on, and you can share them with others so that they don't have to make the same mistake. So that's what we want to preach to you this morning. We you take your Bible or your iPad or phone or wherever your copy of the Word of God is? Look at Psalms 128. That's what we're going to be preaching out of today, Psalms 128. And we're going to be finding and talking about the recipe for the family. What makes a family right? What are the ingredients that go into a family? You know, with a recipe, it is always part this and part that and part this. And we're going to talk about what the ingredients are for the family. But then we're also going to talk about some ingredients that should never go in the family recipe. Never go in there. And then we're going to talk about complimentary dishes. Anybody know what a complimentary dish is? Something that goes well with something? It's like how many people like gravy on their mashed potatoes? But you don't want gravy in your mashed potatoes. Everybody with me? It goes well with the potatoes. It goes well on top of the potatoes. It's like salt goes good with certain things. But salt doesn't always belong in certain things. And today, we're going to be talking about this recipe for the family. Now, I want you to notice in Psalms 128, the psalmist is writing. And he describes the family that we all want. He describes the type of family that every person, when they got married, was envisioning in their mind. This is what it is. Now, look what it says in verse number 1. We're going to read all six verses. The Bible says, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Thy wife shall be a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants round about thy table. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion, and thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children, and peace upon Israel. Let us pray. Father, we come to you, and Lord, as we preach about the family, God, as we preach about the home, as we preach about marriage and children and husbands and wives, God, we ask you that you would speak into our lives and supernaturally get a hold of our families. Lord, I pray, God, that you would take the burden I have for family, you would place it on every person in this room, God, they would view and see you as the need for them. 
and that they would desire to raise their kids and their grandchildren and, their, and, and be the husband and the wife that you want us to be. Lord, I pray, God, you'd bless us, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is the ingredients. He gives us this, this lifestyle here. He, he reads out, he, he writes down what a beautiful family looks like. And he says this, blessed, which means happy is. And you see, we all want a happy family, don't we? All want a happy family. But what is the recipe to a happy family? And I want you to see this quickly. I, I got so much I got to say, I got to run on. But I want to start with the first thing. How many people know what a secret ingredient is? Anybody here got a, a recipe where you got this little thing that you do extra and you won't tell nobody what you do? You know what I'm talking about? That secret ingredient? Well, what is the secret ingredient of a family? Well, the secret ingredient is God. In verse number one, it says, Blessed is everyone that feareth what? The Lord. And what does it say in verse four? It says this, And blessed is he that feareth God. The Lord. You understand that the Lord is the most important ingredient in every family. But you know how most families work? This is the recipe for the family. We put a lot of stuff in here. You understand that God's called us. He says, hey, if you want a happy family, man, you better put me in there. I mean, you better put me in the family. But understand that God is not just part of the recipe. He is most of the recipe. You know, most Christians, here's how they live their life. They should be putting God in their family, and what they're putting in is whatever this measurement is right here. I would tell you what it is, but I can't read it. Most people go, yeah, preacher, we're a Christian family. I mean, we've got God in our, in our family. Everybody with me? You know, I want you to know God's like butter. You can't have too much of it. I mean, when you think, you know what, we got enough God in there, you know what you better do? Go and get you another scoop of him, put it on in here. It's like garlic, bro. You, you can't have enough of it. You mean, when you think, boy, there's enough God in that recipe, oh, no, you better go on back. You better get some more of him. You better pour it on in here. And, friend, I want you to understand this, that the most important thing uh, in your family ought to be God today. You know why it's quiet in here, right? You got about this much of him in there. Oh, I'm a Christian, that much. Preacher, I don't know why my family's not turned out right. I don't know why my kids aren't doing good. Preacher, I don't know why my marriage is on the rocks. I know why. God ain't within 100 square miles of your house. Okay, now, first service was amen, and they were going on. Christians must have been in the first service, Dusty. That must have been what it was. I, I want you to understand that God is the secret ingredient. He's the thing that holds the whole thing together. And if you don't have God in here, friend, I want you to know this. You might have a family, but you won't have it long, and you won't have the results that you seek in your life. God is the main component in a family. My wife said, every time we went wrong, it's when we did stuff our way. Can I amen that time and time again? Every time I wasn't the husband, I should be. You know what the problem was? Wasn't my wife. Every time I wasn't the father, I should be. You know what the problem was? Wasn't my children. You know what the problem was? There wasn't enough God in me. So you can't have enough God in you. You see, when God fills you up, fills your home up, you know what happens? Things start to change, and you don't have to make it happen. It just happens because God is at the center of your recipe. If God's at the center of your home, guess what? Things will look different. They look different. Most of us sprinkle some God into our family when he should make up our whole family. In Deuteronomy chapter number 6, we use this passage all the time for, for baby dedications. It says that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. It also goes on to say, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children. And you should talk about God when you sit in your house, when you walk in the way, when you come in, and when you go out, you should tie them around your fingers and tell everybody everywhere about God. If you go to Israel and you go to a Jew's house, that is a believing, professing uh, 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 Jew, when you walk up to his front door, you know what you'll find? There's like a little envelope on the right side of the door. You open the door, the envelope's right here. You know what's in that envelope? The law of God. 
When that Jew comes home and he has to walk by the law of God, it reminds him that God's law is important. When he goes out of the house, he has to walk back by the law of God, and it reminds him that the law of God's important. The Jew will then take strings, and while they're reading the law in their home, they'll be reading a particular passage, they'll take a string and tie it around their finger. And when they, throughout the day, when they look at that string on their finger, they're reminded of the law of God that they read that day. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying with everything in them to remember God in their everyday life. And church, I want to say this to you, that one of the reasons our families are failing all over America is that many of us have forgotten God, and there ain't a pinch nor a dash of God in our families. We wonder what's wrong with our children. Friend, it's not the school, by the way. Somebody say amen so your kids know you're right. I'm right. It's not the kids, it's not the school that's the problem. Friend, understand this today, that it's not the community that we live in's problem. It's the home's problem. When God is removed from the home, he will then be removed from everything else. Everything else. The secret ingredient is God. But preacher, I've got enough God in my child's life. I've got enough God in my family life. Let me tell you something. Wayne, you better go back and get some more and put it in there just to make sure. Everybody with me? It's like vanilla extract. It calls for two tablespoons. You know what that means. Half a bottle. Yeah. It's good, good. You understand God's that same way. You put him in your life and you think you've got enough, I promise you, you don't. And any Christian that will tell me, hey, I'm where God wants me to be spiritually. You know what that tells me, Dusty? They're liars and they ain't nowhere near where God wants them to be. Because if you're close to where God wants you to be, you know what you'll realize? You'll never get to where you want to be. There will always be work to do. Always. The minute somebody starts, I'm a good Christian, I know right then. No, they're not. They're not. Because if you feel that way, you have not embraced Jesus. You have not embraced the attitude of Jesus. You have not, changed, you have not embraced the humility of serving God and becoming his disciple. So the first ingredient is what? God. If you don't have God in your marriage, we might as well quit talking right now. If you don't have God in your family, we might as well quit talking right now. Until you get God at the base of your recipe for your home and your marriage, everything else will fall apart in your marriage. Everybody with me? Shake your head so I know you're breathing. Okay, good. What's the second recipe? What's the second thing? I want you to see. Look at this. What's the second thing? A cool dude. Every family needs a cool man in that family. You know what I mean? You, you know what I'm talking about. You need, a, you need a, a cool dad, right? You need a cool cool husband. You need to be a cool, super sharp guy, right? That's what we all need. We all got to have that. We see that in verse number, uh, what do we see that in? We see it in verse number four. It says, behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. That passage describes that cool dude as somebody a man who fears God. Everybody with me? Now, I want you to get this. I'm not talking about somebody who's scared of God. I'm talking about somebody who fears God. You say, preacher, what do you mean? I want you to know, Matt Burrell does not fear God striking him dead. I don't fear that. You know what I fear? I fear God taking his blessing off of me. I fear God taking his hand off my family. That's what I fear. That's what I fear. But you know, when I talk to women, I say, hey, what you looking for in a husband? Y'all ready? Here's what women tell me. I'm looking for some kindness. You know, women are all into that. You know, responsible, loving, affectionate. I want security. I want consideration. I want loyalty. I want someone who is romantic. That's what women want. That's what they tell me they want. But you know what most women are attracted to? Let me just say that. And I, I want to. Losers. <laughs> addicts. Needy. People who ain't ever grown up. Irrational, jealous men. That's who women are called. Preacher, I, I, I know people say he's not right for me. And I know he lives in the back of his car. But, I mean, he's just so deep. You just don't know him the way I know him. He's an awesome guy. He's a loser, that's what he is. The reason nobody in your family likes him is he ain't worth five cents. 
If I wasn't in church, I'd just tell you, women have turd for taste in their, in with their men. That's what they do. They do. They, they are seeking out the worst possible human, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm in love with him. And when you talk to them, you know what they always say. But preacher, you don't know him the way I know him. I'm like, I don't know him, but I know a thousand losers just like him. Women are trying, the, 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 the worse they look, tore up jeans, sleeve, tattoo, living in the back of a Volkswagen, traveling around, wouldn't work in a pie factory. That is most women's type right there. He's so cool. He plays the guitar, you know, and he's just like deep. He's a loser. That's what he is. Let me tell you something, ladies. You want somebody that's going to serve you in your life, and you want somebody to build a life around, you find a man who fears God. I promise you, he fears God. He serves God. He wants to honor God. And if he don't want to, kick him down the curb and get rid of him. And if you're a teenage girl in here and you can't get rid of him, talk to your daddy. He'd be glad to get rid of him for you. He'd love to. Nothing makes a dad more happy than, hey, get off my porch. Don't ever come back here. You understand that we've got to change the priority. What are you looking for in a man? You see, most women go and get somebody that they're attracted to. What it really means is they have no standard. This is what I want. This is what I expect. And I will not settle on anything, above, anything lower than this. But what most women do they go drag out this guy from the gutter. I'm going to fix him. No, you're not. You're not going to fix him. If he's sorry now, he'll be sorry later. Yeah, but you don't believe God can change me. I believe he can, but you can't. And you gambling on your la the rest of your life on somebody you're not sure you can change. You see, if you don't love the Lord, he's not worthy of you. Somebody say Amen. Let your daughters know that's okay to say. It's okay to say this. If he doesn't care for God and the things of God, he does not belong to, he does not deserve you in your marriage. He doesn't. Preacher, I don't know why we're having marital trouble. I do. You married a loser. Yeah. You tell me I'm lying. Some of you in here have been divorced. You'd stand up and say, yeah, I married one of them losers. I learned the second time I married me a good one. Let me tell you something. A man that fears the Lord ought to be sexy. You ain't never heard that word in church, have you? <laughs> but he ought to be. Not that just vagrant looking. Mm. That's how women are. You know why good guys always finish last? Because women's taste is terrible in men. Terrible. That's true. If you've lived any time, you've seen it over and over. Over and over. Y'all can't take it today. The Bible says, blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the way of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by a river of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. Friend, we all want to be the tree that brings forth fruit. But it starts by delighting in the law of God. And women, if you want a man who will be fruitful, you better find a man who loves the Lord, delights in the Lord, cares about the word of the Lord, and then you are marrying someone who will be fruitful in their life. That's what it ought to be like. And listen, girls, if you've got a problem trying to decide whether that guy deserves you or not, let me interview him. I'll be honest with you. I don't mind. I will. I'll take his application, sit down, talk with him, insult him, and run him off if he's not up to par. I don't mind. But let me give you the second, the third thing. What's the th oh, hey, hold on. I forgot to put the man in the pot, didn't I? Look. You don't put as much of the man as you do God. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Put tons of God. Let's put some more God in there. It needs it. But what's the third thing we need? A hot woman. You know what? Every man wants in a wife? Hot. You know my sons, every woman, every, every, every one of my sons dated, you know what they always tell me? Hey, Dad, I met this girl. I say, oh, yeah, what's she like? She's hot. <laughs> what's her last name? I don't know, man, she's hot. <laughs> Who's her parents? I don't know, but, Dad, this girl is smoking hot. 
That's how my sons pick, that's how they want to pick wives. You know, you know Dusty, I mean, we know, we, we know we've been there, right? I, I, I never forget Wes, he used to play the guitar, old campus. Liv's here, she'd get embarrassed. I never forget one Sunday after service, Liv had come in, sit down with her mama. Wes up here playing after service. He said, who's that hot blonde sitting down there in the back, Dad? That, that's the only standard men have in women, hot. They don't care about nothing else. They want her to be hot. And if she's attractive, they don't care if she's shallow. shallow. They don't care if she's dumb as a bag of hammers. They don't care what she's like. They don't care nothing. But is she hot or not? That's how guys are. That's how they do. Oh, yeah. It don't matter where she's from, what she does. But I want you to understand this today. That hotness is not where it's all at, guys. Hey, I know many a guy run off some hot girl, and he didn't get down the road good, and they wasn't together again. You see, here's what the verse says, verse 3. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. He said, your wife will add to your life. She will bring forth fruit. She'll add to your life. And friend, I want, to know, I want you to know this in here. If she don't love God, you don't need to be with her. I don't care how hot she is. I just happened to marry a hot girl that loved God. It can happen to you too. But you've got to set that standard. What does Proverbs say? Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. You understand that if you're going to have a happy marriage, I don't care what she looks like, if she don't love God, it will not be the marriage you want it to be in your life. But you were having marital troubles because you married the wrong person. By the way, there's no perfect people, you understand that, right? Right? But when one person loves God and wants to honor God and be like God, and the other person wants to honor God, love God, and be like God, I promise you it's a whole lot easier for them to work out problems than you got one who loves God and the other one don't care anything about God. You all with me? I think you died. Some of you are scared. Some of you need to say amen so your kid sitting beside you know you will body slam a brother. He comes up on the porch and you don't like him. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm telling you. You see... There's an idea of, 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 of what the standard should be, should be a standard based on God. Because by the way, what is the number one ingredient? If a woman doesn't love God, how's the recipe going to turn out? If a man doesn't love God, how is the recipe going to turn out? It's not going to turn out the way you want it. So if you really want marriage that works, you really want a home that works, you really want children that come along and do what you want, you know what they need? God. All that other stuff, hot, cool, all that, that don't mean anything. You don't date anybody based on the car they drive. Listen to me. Y'all hear me? I, that's not, those aren't standards. Standard is, do you love God? Do you honor God? Are you the kind of person who wants to serve God with me the rest of your life? I, I, no, I don't. Well, then we're not going to work out. Let me give you this. I got to give you this. Wait, did I put the woman in here? The woman is a lot in the pot. But she still ain't as much as God. You understand? She's heaping when you put it in here. You want a lot of her in it. But you still don't put as much as God. Because God's still the most important thing. What's the fourth thing every family's got to have? Look at it up here. Perfect children. And if you find one, Dale, let me know. How many people realize you're never going to have perfect children? Anybody tells you your kids are perfect, they're liars. Well, I never had to whip him. That just means he could hide a lot better than everybody else. They never got in trouble. It's because you didn't catch them. They're just good at sneaking. But I promise you, every little kid's got issues, every little one, except my grandboys. They don't have a problem at all. But I'm telling you right now, perfect children. You've got to have children in this, this marriage, just this children come into this family. They're important. But, friend, I want you to understand this. Do you know what a perfect child really is? A perfect child who is, is a child who's being raised in the nurture and the admonition of God. How many people realize it's our job as parents to raise our children, train our children in the way they should go? How many people believe and understand that your children do not, do not, do not know the way they should go? It's your job to teach them the way they should go in their life. Let me come down here. You ain't heard me. Some of you parents, and your kids run you around, tell you, and lead you, and all that stuff. That's not biblical, not one bit. 
The Bible says train up a child in the way he should go. It is your job to bring a child from a baby all the way up to an adult, and you should be leading them to Jesus Christ the entire way. That should be where you're trying to go. Let me tell you all something. I mean this with everything. I don't care what if my children never, ever have good jobs. I don't care if they ever make a lot of money in their life. I don't care. I, don't lay a bed, I do not lay in the bed at night and worry if my kids got money. It means nothing to me. I don't lay in the bed at night when my kids were growing up and worry what kind of social staff. Will they become a doctor, Dusty? Are they going to become a lawyer? Are they going to become somebody of importance? I have never, ever worried about that in my life. Not one time. I don't care. I don't care if my children couldn't throw a baseball, football, shoot a basketball. I don't give a rip if they ever, ever, ever can play sports. Oh, inside of me, I care more than anything is that they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they spend an eternity with him in heaven. That is my only goal for my children. I don't care if they work picking up garbage the rest of their life, live in a meager house with meager things and don't have very much, but if they love and honor God and die and go to heaven, it would thrill me to my soul. I'm afraid. I'm afraid in the church. There are people who will raise their children to be sports superstars and that child will make them happy because they turned out in the sports world or they turned out in the business world and they'll die and go to hell because they never, ever experienced the life-changing salvation of Jesus Christ. And the sad part is we will celebrate it and never think about the eternity that our children will face. Church, your number one priority ought not be what your children will make or what their title will be. It ought to be, do they know God, and will they, or do they honor God, and are they saved by His grace, and do they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? That should be the pinnacle, listen to me. When my last child accepted Christ, I tell you, it was like a weight just rolled off of me. But when my, 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 when my children had children, then all of a sudden the weight jumped back on me. You know, I pray for Billy and, 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 and Matthew every night and every morning. I don't pray, God, I want them to be this. God, you know, help them learn that. I say, Lord, you know, I love you. And boy, I've tried to honor you. And boy, God, I just want you to just, I just want you to let them grow up to come to know you. I want them to be saved. I want them to have a home in heaven. And my greatest concern is that they wouldn't. Everything else, who cares? Who cares? All I care is if two little rascals grow up to know Jesus Christ. That's all I care about. If they do that, boy, this preacher right here be happy. Friend, I could preach this for days about children, but I ain't there yet. We're going to preach marriage next week. You've got to be here for that. Then I'm going to preach wives. Then I'm going to preach husbands. The reason I'm doing that is because husbands lands on Father's Day. But I'm always nicer to the women. And then we're going to preach on some parenting. But I want to show you a couple things quickly. I talked about the things that go in it. God, lots and lots, probably needs to have more put in. Husbands, cool dude, a man who fears God, the hot wife who loves the Lord, children who are being raised for the Lord. That, that is the recipe. That's it. But what doesn't go in here? You know, some things you never put in a recipe, you know. Some things just don't go in here. I want you to understand that outside influences don't go in here. You know that, that friend you got, guys? Go, he's single, goes down to the club every Friday night. He don't go in here. Matter of fact, you run him off. You don't even be hanging out with him. You know that single girl, got, uh, ladies, that, you know, she's got the life you ain't got, lives at the tan bed and nail salon, ain't got no kids, lives on margaritas and protein shakes. You know what I'm talking about? She don't go in here. She don't go in here. She'll make, she'll make you discontent with this right here. He'll, friend, that, that single friend, he'll make you not like this. He will. Secular thinking doesn't go in here. I, just say, I don't give a rip what Dr. Phil says about your marriage. I don't care. I don't care what any book written anywhere, I don't care what they say. You need to just do this in your marriage. You know, I saw something one time. If, if you, Dale, if you want your marriage to just really succeed, you just got to get in touch with your feminine side. I'm like, what does that even mean? Like, I mean, what does that mean? 
Let me tell you something. If you want to know how to be married, you want to know how to be a dad, you want to know how to serve God, get in the Word of God. It will help you. You don't need that stuff put in here. You don't need that stuff in here. Worldly advice. You, you know those books that everybody's writing. How many people realize that they write those books for a reason? It's because they want to sell them. It's not because they're just concerned about your marriage. If they're concerned about your marriage, what would they do with those books? They'd give them to everybody. Why don't they give them away? They weren't written to be given away. They weren't written to be helped. They were written to make money. Listen, friends, social media has nothing to do with how you parent, how you're married, or how anything else. This idea, well, look at that couple over there. They're just doing nothing. Let's give them. Man, listen, don't judge your marriage by their marriage. By the way, they're lying. That's not how their life is anyway. I, I got to be done. There's things that don't go in there. But what's the comp What's the gravy? What's that complimentary stuff that goes with it but shouldn't be in it? Everybody with me? You know what a complimentary something is? Something that goes on the side. It's like when we have roast, we got green beans. Why? Because they just go good together, you know? Let me tell you some things that go good together but can't be in there. Hobbies. You see, how many people realize hobbies don't go in here? You get a hobby, men. Let me, let me show you your hobby. This ain't your hobby. That's your hobby. This is your children's hobby. This is your th 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 hobby. You know why I call it a hobby? It means it's not important. Work, important. Hobby, optional. Everybody with me? Quiet in here. Y'all all right? You sure? Some of you looking down the floor, did you drop something back there in the back? Here's your hobby. It goes alongside and goes well with, but it don't go in. When, when, when this is a thing where you're taking God out so you can put hobby in, because you've got to make room, it don't work. Let me give you another In-laws. You know why I can talk about in-laws? I am one. I got, I got in-laws now. So, so here's the deal. You know, you know what I'm supposed to be as an in-law? A complimentary dish to the family. Now listen to me. My son and, and Leo, you know, they're married, got, got a son, got a house, got their own thing. They're in their own world, right? You know what my job as in-law is? Come alongside them, help them when I can, do what I can. But the minute I try to get in here, Wes needs to come look me in the face and say, Hey, Dad, go find something to do. This is my business. Everybody with me? My, my, my son-in-law, Billy, I come to him and I get in his business. He needs to say, Hey. Pop, you need to back off. Get up out my business. This is my family. This is my marriage. It's my home. So you know what I have to do? I have to come alongside them, and when I can help them, I help them. And when I can be there for them, I'm there for them. And everything I do should add to their life. Listen to me, in-laws. Not detract from their life. Add to. Make better. That's my job. See, that's hard. That's how it is. Friends. Friends are wonderful. Man, I, I tell you, if you find a real friend, good friends, friends that you really trust and love, they're, they're, they're the best thing in the world, right? But they still don't go in here. So you get those friends. They're great. They're awesome. They go over here. But they're served with the family. Compliment the family. Church, here, here's how I want to finish tonight, today. I want you to leave this place. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit down with your wife, husband, kids, and, and, and particularly husbands and wives. And I want you to look at each other and say, how much God is in our marriage? How much God is in our family? Is it making up most of the recipe, or is Matt and what Matt wants making up most of the recipe? You know? Is Matt about Matt, or is Matt really about God? I want husband and wives to do that. I want you to say, if we looked in our pot, and we divided it out in ingredients. These four ingredients, how much of God is in here? That's the first thing I want you to do. First thing I want you to do. And then the second thing I want you to do is look in that pot. And Dusty, we've all had to do this in our lives, and even in our marriage and our families, and look in there and say, that don't belong in there. Bad ingredients that need to be kicked out of your family. Bad influences. Things that shouldn't be there. And dad, mom, you're going to have to be brave enough to go, that's got to go. Some of your kids need to hear the word no occasionally. Probably more than occasionally. Probably a lot. 
But you need to say, this doesn't belong here. We're removing this out of it. And then, and then if you're in here and you're an in-law like me, I, I, want you to, I want you to evaluate, am I complimenting this family? Am I, am I here as a supporting and, and loving role? Am I accomplishing that? Dad and moms, I want you to look over here and say, where are the hobbies at? Are they out here or are they in here? Is what I want, my pleasure out here or is it in here? You see, church, our community has a problem. It all starts in the home. When the family is right, everything else is right. Everything else is right. But when the family's wrong, the church is wrong. The, the community's wrong. The school is wrong. Everything's wrong because it spills out from where we're at. You are in charge of and you are a part of the greatest thing God ever made, and that's called family. And if you get the recipe right, not perfect, get it right, God can do something in your home and your life. Let's pray. Father, I ask you, God, to speak to hearts today. Lord, transfer my burden to everyone that's here. Help us, Lord, to see, to know, to want to experience the family that honors you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're not having an altar call, not having anybody come forward because of social distancing. But, but here's what I want to uh, challenge you, right where you're at. Dads, how much God's in you? Husbands, uh, wives, how much God's in you? Families, how much God is in that family? Lady, you, you looking for the right man or just a man? Guy, are you looking for a girl or are you just looking for a godly girl? What, what do you really want? Examine your heart, examine your motives, examine your mind. And as we go to prayer here in a moment, I want you to ask God to challenge you and your family to improve upon the recipe that you guys got going. Will you pray with me? Father, bless everyone that's here today, all those that are online watching, all the families that will experience this sermon. God, I ask you, God, that you would speak into their lives and help us to examine the recipe we've got cooking. God, help us to get it right according to you. Get it right according to your word. Help us, Lord, to raise our children and grandchildren and our families for you. God, help you to be the most important thing and not us. God, we love you today. Bless our church. Bless our families. Bless all those that are watching online. God, bless our nation. In Jesus' name.